it is a wonderful to have um, Caroline back with us. In fact, we sort of fell in love in March when she was here last, and she was here with Andrew Harvey, and some of you, a good many of you, were here with us at, the, at that time. If you were, raise your hand. Let's just, yeah, oh. I thought so. And so then you said, we'd love to have a solo with Caroline Mace. So I said, Caroline, our group would love to have a solo with you, and I would love to have you back. Can you do it this year? And so she worked magic with her schedule, and I held my breath as hurricane season approached, because of course, for those of us who live here, we know the calamity that hurricanes can heap on us in oh. this area along the sea. So we've been very fortunate. This has worked out so well, and we have so many of you. And I'm just going to say that we have, of course, people from all over Charleston and the Low Country that are always have fun taking a look to see where else people are here from. So up part, South Carolina for sure, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Florida, Maryland, Michigan, Ohio, New York, Massachusetts, Indiana, Kentucky, Arizona. Where is Arizona? That's a long way. Over here. Are you from Arizona? All right. Colorado, not too far away. Rhode Island, California, Washington State, South Dakota, and Scotland. Is Scotland Who's from in the Scotland? Room yet? Where's my Scottish one? Well, they haven't not landed here yet. yet. Not landed yet. Anyway, it's just awesome. such a pleasure always to have people like you. Really? Wow. Here with us. And knowing that when we gather like this with such high intention to do the work that we're going to be doing with you tonight and tomorrow. You know, we're really doing something to lift the consciousness on the planet, you could say. Whenever we do our deep inner work, that deep inner work impacts us all. And so I so applaud you for your courage to be here in that sort of self-exploration, -ex looking deeply at our relationship to self-esteem and to our own innate empowerment, and with someone like Caroline, who spent her life really working in these profound, profound areas. So Sophia Institute's work really is centered on that deep inner work that leads to an outer action, an action that can make our communities more conscious communities, our workplace a more conscious workplace, our relationships, as we were talking about with this wonderful woman across the room, a more conscious relationship. There's much I can say about Sophia, but I feel like we're already into our day together, our evening with Caroline. So I'm going to thank you for being here. I'm going to say that at the end of the program, we have our books um, for you to purchase if you'd like. Uh, a good many of you are planning to be with us tomorrow, most of you. But if a few of you who are with us today know that you're called to be with us tomorrow, please make sure you let us know that. I want to thank Beth Swetzer, who is our program coordinator for all the work she did. and our volunteers who have helped us out. I also want to thank the wonderful people at Circular Congregational Church who regularly invite us here. There's a real synchrony between their work and our work, and we're always happy to be here at Lance Hall. We say it's a sort of small Parthenon uh, here in Charleston. We're surrounded by the beautiful graveyard, which you were fascinated by as we came in. I mean, there are great stories out oh there. Oh, my God, yeah and the uh, trees and the oak trees all around us. So we appreciate being in this lovely space. I'll close um, now, for now, and say a little more about Sophia Institute at the end. Always, always, we welcome you here with us. And Caroline, it's such a deep and profound pleasure to have you back. I guess like, like I, you've read nearly all of her books, or all of them, starting back 1996, uh. right? <laughs> that wonderful. Uh. And all the work that Caroline has done for energy anatomy, bringing that into the field of science in a profound and wonderful way. She's not going to let me say much, so let's just show her how much we re revere her. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay. Yeah, stop it. Okay. Now, please don't fall. All right. I don't have many drawings. None of them is good. But a few of them are going to make a point. Um, I'm going to begin by saying thank you all for being here. One of my realizations about us sharing a few days together is that the gift of your time is not returnable. Time is the most precious gift we have. I am incredibly mindful that we are exchanging two gifts that neither can refund. And so I try now to script what I teach uh, to include tools you can use the rest of your life, for the rest of your life that actually get into what Teresa of Avila would say, the walls of your soul, and become jewels you can pull out and light up inside of you. I need this jewel. I need this jewel. It will help me here and now. It will help me make a decision. It will help me hang on through a difficult time. So one illustration that's very simple but it's powerful, is just to think of your life, think of you as a building, as a building. And to use this metaphor that you are a building. And this is how consciousness works. The thing about being a building is that once it's built, it's built. It doesn't go anywhere, and the only movement from that point on is in the building. So you can go up any of the flights you want, but you can't move the building. So once you're born, you're structured. You're not, I will not be unborn as an American from an Austrian Polish background. There's nothing I can do. That's the building I'm in. I can't now change, no matter what I do, that I grew up in a Catholic family. That's my building. But I can run up the stairs. Now, what, what happened and why I use this, this symbolic model is because years ago I was actually in New York during a I was in New York during a hot August day, and New York and hot in August is loud and it smells. And I love New York, but there it is, and that's the truth. And I went in to uh, visit a friend who, who had the, the penthouse. So you walk in here, I get up here, and she says, come on out, and she had an iced tea. The two of us sat on her little deck, like little patio, I mean little. I mean, it's like this little area here, which is coveted in Manhattan. Okay, coveted. So she had two chairs and, of course, plants and almost a barbecue, anything they'll squeeze on to make it feel like they have the little park. But here's the truth. I could hardly hear the street down there. And secondly, from up there, I could see the Hudson River. And while this isn't anything to brag about, I could see Jersey. <laughs> Okay, all right, but the point is, all, the vista was huge, and in the evening, it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. Manhattan lit up, and I could actually see stars. Not a lot, granted, but if I was down there, 24 stories lower, and I walked out, if I said to someone on the first floor, do you know you live near a river? They would say, no. Do you know that there's stars? No. Do you know that there's a state called Jersey? No. Same address. Now here's you. If I spoke to you at the first floor of your consciousness and said, do you know that you have what it takes to see a vast universe? It's in you. You have to get up these floors. 
you would, you, you, you would fight that, and you do fight it, because it's, it takes a lot of energy to climb those stairs. There's no elevator in this building. And you need to really understand your life in this metaphor, in this analogy, rather, because it's actually identical. Every time you move up a, a floor, it's more expensive. <laughs> the mortgage costs more. But the view is more spectacular. The air is cleaner. The sounds are more at your discretion. Instead of you responding to the screaming, you'll notice that as you rise, the choice of what you want to listen to becomes yours. So you begin to redefine choice as you go up here. Whereas on the first floor, everybody else has choice but you. But as you go up, you begin to think, I'll choose what I want to hear. I choose what I'll listen to and what. So you become conscious not only of choice, but how powerful choice is and how much of your sense of you is involved in the power of you making choices, which is why relationships are centered around the dynamic of choice. Every relationship is centered around the dynamic of choice, and every divorce is based on the violation or abuse of basically the dynamic of choice. You don't appreciate my choices. You don't listen to my choices. I, this, it is always about choice and power. Always. So as you go up this, these flights in yourself, and you are such a curious creature that you will always wonder what's above you. You'll always, you're compelled to keep going up these flights. You were born knowing, you're born knowing that you can't take a lot of the people who reside with you on the fourth floor to the fifth floor. And if you go to the fifth floor and you see the view, remember you haven't changed the address, but you get there and you think, oh my God, I didn't know that, that building was there and I didn't know you could see the Empire State Building from here and I didn't know that and I didn't know that because you can't see it from the fourth, but you get to the fifth and the horizon opens even more. And you think, wait till I tell everybody on the fourth and the third. <laughs> so you run downstairs thinking, believing that everybody down there is going to be so happy for you. <laughs> that suddenly you have these huge French windows giving you this vast, vast view of a universe they cannot see. And oh my, they're so happy for you. <laughs> and what is wrong with them that they don't appreciate your French windows? <laughs> and that they're not validating your new floor that's so above them, which you are implying it is. <laughs> because you're special and your message to them is, I'm special, I'm conscious, and you're not. What you don't realize is you're not on the fifth floor. You're in the ass end of the third. <laughs> because if you were, you wouldn't go down and rub it in their face. You're in time out. You just don't know it. And you're trying to get them to validate. I am on the fifth, aren't I? Aren't I? And the answer is no. No. Because if you were, that game would be over with. That game would be over with. 
now. This, that self-esteem, where you realize I esteem myself. If I have to keep asking everybody in the universe to, to recognize me, I will spend my rest, the rest of my life weak and powerless, afraid to do anything. Thinking that the reason I do, don't do anything is your fault because you did not recognize me. You did not support me. That's your fault that I'm a failure. No, it's not. That's the way people in the first floor, it's the way a child does it. That's a child. Self-esteem is not support by others and it's not complaining about it. Self when you look to others for support, you realize I, I, I have no capacity to get myself up. Others are not responsible for getting you up and going. Nobody is but you. And you may be angry about that. That's very first floor. And you may want life to be other than this. That it's other people's responsibility to get you going. But it's not. And it's other people's responsibility to, to support you. No, it's not. No one has to support you. Nobody's obliged to support you. Not one person. Not one person was born with the task from God to support you. Look alive. And that's the truth. A horrifying truth most people don't want to kind of deal with, but it is a truth. It is true that you may meet people along the way that say, let's hook up, let's partner up, let's marry, let's be a team for a while, for as long as we can. Let us make that choice and let us bond our souls. Let us make a vow and bond our souls and give to each other what we can. That is a choice, not an obligation. Again, choice. So, are you with me here on this? Yeah. Every floor is different. And I will tell you that as you go up the floors, you are as curious as you are intimidated. You are as um, compelled to become conscious as you will sabotage that journey. You are very good at sabotaging your own journey of empowerment. Again and again and again. Something that we'll go into, but in great detail tomorrow. Why do we do that? We all do that. There's no one who, 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 who do, doesn't do that until we get through little by little. We're a curious lot. But what I wanted to, to emphasize this evening as I open it up is why is it even important to know about self, to discuss it, to be, um, to, to know in your, that self-esteem would be an issue for so many people because it is. It's not just an issue, it's, it's a life-changing dynamic where people know if I don't get this straight, the quality of who I am and the quality of my life and the quality of how I relate to others is, is, is going to collapse if I don't get, this is the big game changer. Now, there was a time when the, the game changers in relationships were stuff, dowries, money, privilege. 
it's not that those things don't matter anymore or that they, they, they still don't have clout that way. But the difference is this. We, the generations of the nuclear age, are a very different species than those who lived before the nuclear age. And the jewel that is self-esteem is your power battery in a way that was not for generations who lived before the nuclear age. Not at all. Before the nuclear age, self-esteem was like self-respect. It was an external force. It was an external principle. It would not have been defined the way we're going to examine it today and tomorrow by any means. It would never be put into the category of if I, of the power of choice and creation and cause and effect in my capacity to maneuver the mystical laws. My capacity to discern the flow of energy into matter and whether or not I want to respond to an illusion a spectacle playing out before my eyes. So that if somebody said to me, hurry, you have to uninvest in these stocks, the market's going to collapse. That your sense of inner relationship to, is, this, is there a crisis in the air? And your inner gut, your inner gut is so clear. You trust that far more than the storm that you see brewing in the first floor, which is the, which is the collective. Because you're on the third, and you can see that Wall Street's not on fire. They're screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. But you are now have an interior sense of self self. And this is a rocky moment, which is accurate. The rumor that the sky is falling, or what your inner guidance, you, or, the, or, the, or the energy you are being guided by. Because as you go up in your consciousness, the world, the physical world, ceases to become that clear and the energetic world begins to become the world you relate to, energy, and then as you take the elevator down, you step into the world of matter. Going along with how the laws of the universe are set up, thought before form, energy into matter, which means if I, decide, if I become psychically crazy, I know that a room will respond to psychically crazy. You know that. You know that if you're angry, it doesn't matter what you say. You vibrate it because you want to communicate it. And you see everybody responding. So you know you are communicating a message, and you watch it play out. Prior to World War I, uh, before the nuclear age, Nobody defined self-esteem like that. Nobody would think of it. It was all about what you had, what you could do, how much you owned. But it shifted when we entered the nuclear age. Everything, the whole rules of life changed. We entered the world behind our eye instead of the world in front of our eye. We entered the rules of how we would perceive reality changed. And, and here's a simple reason why, though there's nothing simple about it. The two wheels 
that have instinctively guided humanity, human beings, our instincts have always been driven on the will to survive and the, the will to create. The instinct to create, the instinct to survive. So we, we, we have the sense that we must survive no matter what, so that no matter what happens, we have to create something to survive this. If, if it's going to be more hurricanes, we have to figure out a way to brace the shore. If it's gonna, we have to create something that's never been done before because something's happened. You know, they created bridges for, to go, go that have never been built before because we need to get on the other side. We always have managed we had new diseases, we found vaccine. We are always trying to create something to address that. In entering this, when we unlocked nuclear consciousness, we entered an era in which our opponents, i.e. weapons of mass destruction, climate change, all of our opponents, we do not have solutions for, not one. We do not know how to outrun the destructive power of nuclear bombs. We do not know. And further, we do not know that we can trust ourselves not to destroy ourselves. In fact, since the time that those weapons were first created, the history of our planet has been rewritten and shaped all around who has the fire like Prometheus. We stole the nuclear fire and it's been, which country has the fire? What do we do about it? What sanctions? What do we do? Who's the terrorist? Da 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 da. And here's the thing, you've grown numb to it. You have actually grown numb to the fact that every single second could be our last. You actually don't believe it. You've become, you've become, you actually think it can't happen. You're in La La Land. There's a part of you that's totally in La La Land because you believe because something has never happened, it cannot happen. And that's how you are, we are with climate change. That's how we are with everything. We think because it cannot, it has not happened, it will not happen when you don't get that if we create this stuff, we want to use this stuff. You do not get that. And that the reason we're in this incredible passage that we're in, this passage of opioid addiction, this passage of high voltage depression, epidemics of madness, epidemics of utter, utter insanity, epidemics of complete social confusion, relationship confusion, the in inability of people to make a commitment, inability of relationships to stick, is because every single species and every single human being, every tree, every bird, every plant, every fish, every everything, knows its future is on the line. I hear music, why is there music playing? Why is that on? Every single species knows its future is on the line. And we are all evolving together. We know it. And the quality of choices that we need to make have got, we have to raise the bar on the choices we, we need to make. It can't be the way it has been because those are the choices that got us here. 
we need to become a very different species. Now, to accommodate that, what's happened in the last 50 years is that we have become different than the people before. We have, we are opening our intuitive senses. We're becoming far more energetically conscious and aware and sensitive than the species prior to World War II. And I, I'm gonna say a lot about that tomorrow, but tonight let me say this. When I comment like this, I did not add the word special. <laughs> Becoming multi-sensory doesn't mean you're special or conscious or anything. As a matter of fact, if it did, we wouldn't be in the hell hole that we're in. Would that it did make us more special and more conscious. But in fact, we are more drugged and more unconscious, more selfish than we were before. More narcissistic, with a rise in barbarianism and brutality, when in fact we consider ourselves so conscious. So let us not assume that as we become more aware of our global connection and our intuitive nature, it has not advanced the way we live together at all. Okay, so no, no, no thinking like, that's right, I'm one of those conscious indigo colored. <laughs> Don't even ever go there. But where you have to go and where we go is this. The crisis we're in is because we're not, we refuse to go there. The crisis we're in is that the time has come where we face the fact that we have an increased range of sensibility and sensitivity and we're not addressing what that means. Like, what does it mean to be, to recognize um, I'm getting intuitive guidance now, whereas before, when my mother was making decisions or my father, they talked to each other. And it would have been very odd for my mom to say, I got it on the inner that we should do this. Right? I mean, my father would have said, who are you talking to? Who's in her? You know? I mean, yeah. all right. It would have been like that. He's a World War II Marine. He's not going to, who's in her? You know, a new neighbor, right? Um, that's not how, but today, we are wiring ourselves very differently. We're responding to ourselves very differently, but we do it in piecemeal as it serves us. We're not living there full time. We do it in small doses when convenient, but we don't make the leap to the fourth floor where living is, is more rigorous, more expensive because you have to start living how you're built and who you are full time. Not occasionally, but full time. So the way you make choices and decisions simply becomes a matter of what is congruent. What is congruent? What doesn't fracture you? What keeps you from hemorrhaging to thine own self be true. Now in a lower, down here, a way people would make decisions is what will they say? And it's okay 
We have to, we have to still always keep the tribe in mind when we make decisions. But it's out of esteem for the tribe. Will this decision harm the tribe? And seven generations of it. Will this decision harm the tribe? Because the law is what is in one is in the whole. What I do to you, I do to, what I do to you, I do to everybody. I am interconnected. I cannot treat one of my cells of my body. One of my cells, you are like a body, a cell of my body. I can't treat one of you that doesn't touch all of you. You cannot treat me and not touch everybody in this room. We are one holy body of life. And that is a mystical truth. And as you get up to the higher floor, we begin to realize we are one. We are one. That tr when we're on the first floor, the only people we apply that to are our blood family. But as we rise up here, we realize all life is one. All life breathes together. And it's very, very, very difficult to live that truth. The amount of esteem that you have to hold for all life and the quality of choices you have to make will break you in half. And when the saints, you know, we call those people who could do it saints, we gave them titles as a way of saying, I could never do that. <laughs> so we gave them titles that separated them from us by calling them a category so rare so we never would have to do that. What's that? Oh, that person's a saint. <laughs> oh, well. Pfft. Okay. And this was how we separated ourselves from the challenge of being congruent and conscious. Let them do it, and then we'll go visit their shrines. <laughs> hey, yo, you, you want to pray for me? That kind of thing. Or hang out with a guru or start talking like these people do. I know someone who knows someone who knows a guru. As if you're holy by default. Okay. It's like liquidated holiness, you know, like a you know, homeopathic holiness, right? But this era is this the chaos that's happening to us is the chaos of transitioning worlds, transitioning eras, transitioning between a way of seeing the world, a way of being in the world, a way of understanding the world, and having the world come through us instead of out there and in us. And this is what the holistic health movement has really done. We've become many Earths. In other words, what, you know, in, in, in accepting the template that your body, mind, spirit are an integrated system, do any of you think that's not true? Okay. How about this one? That if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, you're sick, and specifically, you've got a kidney disorder, and so I got some medicine, but it's going to blow your heart right out of your body. So what do you want to do? <laughs> There's a real good chance you would say later, I want to talk to someone who knows how to treat the whole. Now I'm going to translate that. And that's because you are plant, let's go up here to the symbolic world. Symbolically speaking, you are now behaving and approaching yourself as one whole planet. 
and all the organs of your body are no longer sovereign nations. You realize and you are approaching your earth as an integrated system of nations, of rivers, of air, And all the problems you deal with in your life are your little micro of the macro problems of humanity. And as you resolve yours, you're contributing to the resolution of everybody's. This is your experience of the macro earth simultaneously on your micro earth. So how you deal with all that is in your life is how you resolve all that is in the world. Everything you do in your planet, everything is a contribution of the grandest power to the whole. For what you settle between two people, if Brenda and I finally worked out something that is a micro map of how to work something we contribute to the whole that the whole can draw upon. This is how you work that out. That consciousness doesn't evaporate. It doesn't evaporate. How you work out everything on your planet with whomever you're working out is contributing to the whole and everybody who has that planet, or who has that issue, who is hurting in the way you, who's lonely in the way you are, who's facing loss in the way you have. can draw upon your experience when they pray, God, help me. That reservoir of human experience, that, glow, that collective compassion of how we are journeying through loss together comes to that person, including how well you have journeyed through that. And when you bow your head in prayer and say, on behalf of everyone, help me get through this, I am not going through this alone. I am not the only hu human being who has walked through loss. Others will after me. Others have before me. Help me, God. This is how you pray. You do not separate yourself from the human community as if you are the only one who has ever, ever what? Ever what? Been born? Die? What? Tell me one thing. One that only you have done and I will give you my estate. <laughs> Such as it is. <laughs> Including my crazy dog. Tell me what to separate yourself from the whole is one of the most torturous things you can do by demanding that you be noticed, unlike anybody else, because you're so extraordinary. And we live in this hell hole, and one of the things that's true is that people today think self-esteem is based upon being noticed and being special. And people will say to me, I was born to be special. I know I was born for something special. What kind of spiritual garbage is that? That's like saying I've signed up for suffering. I've signed up for suffering because I, I was born to be special, which is saying I'm not going to do, here's my definition of special, I want to work two days a week. I want to be recognized. I don't want it difficult. I don't want to get my hands dirty. I don't want any apprenticeship. I want to be immediately successful, lots of money. I want to be able to travel and I probably want to work two months a year. It's got to be meaningful to leave that out. And other people have to be so impressed, especially people who humiliated me. I want to make them feel bad. That's what people think. We've become people who hold 
ordinary in contempt. So they named their kids, what's your kid's name? Sunshine medication, Meditation Karma. <laughs> and if one more person says to me, my child is special, if they only knew what I was thinking, if you, if you only knew what I was thinking, huh? you really want to know? I think that poor child, that poor child, what a lie you're feeding that child. What a curse. What a curse. Because if you think that everybody else in this world is going to tell that kid he or she's famous or special or whatever, and what do you think special entitles them? That comes entitlement. I don't have to work. I don't have to this. And what you don't get is you're killing that kid's survival instincts. You're killing it, destroying it, because they're special. They don't have to do anything to survive. They don't have to develop their talent. They don't have to try. They don't have to try. Why would parents do that to their children? You don't have to do anything because you're special. What a disaster. May as well, I can't even tell you what a disaster. What a disaster. You tell them, you are so loved, I can hardly squeeze it in. Tell them that. Tell them, I love you so much, it doesn't fit on the moon. But watch the dangerous words. We'll get to the power of words tomorrow, not tonight. What? Can you tell them you did these? No, because they're not. Why? But what? But you, you, you know, how does the child understand that? Oh yes, but in, when he's older, it's on. When he's older, there's nothing wrong with saying somebody that. I, you know, to me, it all depends on what is implied. Exactly. So you have to be very careful on how you imply. Like everybody's different. Everybody yes. has the a, a, a path to walk, and that's what makes everybody, so if it's presented in the way it should be presented, like mm -hmm. it should be presented like a seventh floor truth, mm -hmm. and, and not like something where a child, where a person gets to feel that being different makes them better, and that they look at a difference as a way of, can we turn off phones, people? That looking, you know, you get it. I've made that point. Okay. Now I want to go back because I, there's something else I want to talk about this time that makes it a privilege to be alive now. Because I think the era you're living in is such a great big huge deal that you can't afford not to know certain things, which is why having the courage to be you at this time is so important. Having the courage to be fully you, fully you, to not, you know, in the old world, in the old world, people always looked for excuses not to be you, not to be them. You know, I, I don't have time. The kids aren't this. Da, 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 da. The excuses. If you're born now, then you're on time. Because this is when you were supposed to be born. There isn't a cosmic mistake with your birth. Which means by virtue of that, you are... The, the, the stars are lined up for why you are here. So you, when somebody has <coughs> asked me, I've been in, in so many conversations with people from all over the world, why am I here, why am I here, why am I here? And 
when, you know, when we struggle with that, which everybody does, which everybody does, that was, that was not a good thing to do, Carol. Um, we do that because we, we go through those questions at the, um, from the first floor where we ask, like, why am I here? And we want physical details. We want facts. We want productive details because we have an allegiance to a God of production. The God we believe in is a very job-driven God, <laughs> a very practical God, an off-planet male that employs us. <laughs> and if the inspiration we get is not practical, by God, we don't follow it. And we want that inspiration to include bank account money information. It better not disrupt our bank account, by God, by God, God. So the God we've invented, emphasis on the word invented, the God that doesn't exist, nevertheless we want to exist, is an off-planet male, white, bearded, who's a businessman <laughs> and a Supreme Court judge <laughs> who always has a reason for why things happen as they do and is always on your side when you bring a case to the Supreme Court. Just tell me why this has happened. Just tell me why. This is not fair. I scream unjust. And when we pray, we expect guidance that is absolutely practical or we will not follow it and we will lock ourselves in. Because the idea that guidance could be what we declare it mystical, experiential, dreamlike, symbolic, does not appeal to you when you're living on the first floor because the first floor is where the mail's delivered and that means mortgage, bills. And that's where you say, are you kidding? Look at this. You fail to learn how creation operates. That your, your energy, your power, determines how the laws of the universe function in your life. The more fear, the slower they function. Now getting that through to you is very difficult. And we'll chat on that at length tomorrow. But at this point, part of this extraordinary turning point, I mentioned health. I mentioned the sovereign nations of your body organs. But also, the principles of health that began to filter into us, which that we create our reality, that somehow our attitudes, and this is where my life came in, this is where my life journey began with this, that our attitudes somehow affect the quality of our health. And this is where I began my work in, when? The early 1980s. When was that? A long time ago. The early 1980s. Now this is a big deal because prior to that, pre-nuke, we did not examine our attitudes, attitude by attitude by attitude by attitude. Emotion by emotion by emotion by emotion. Hurt feeling by hurt feeling by hurt feeling. Memory by memory by memory. What did we start doing? Was turning our attention to our inside. 
with a microcosmic detail and curiosity unlike anything that had ever existed before. Now we became fascinated with how we worked at the subcutaneous level, at the power of our thoughts, at the wave of an emotional. We were looking at our quantum physics self, the, the counterpart to nuclear energy. We are investigating our nuclear power source, which is our soul. Our soul. So just as this is happening, there's a huge collision of the gods in the air, which is also, also part of the catastrophe happening, causing the chaos on the earth, which is all the major, like the Abrahamic religions, are colliding, colliding. For the first time, there's two popes in the Catholic Church and a collision with all the, the priests. And you can, you can, in the first floor, at the first floor level, you could say it's just pedophilia and all that evil. But if you do that, just like if you look at all the world governments, from the first floor, just like if you look at your life crises on the first floor, you will never understand what's really going on. The first floor is where, in the language of Buddha, everything is the illusion. Everything, everything, all the energies in our lives have got to take some form so that we can touch them, so that we can see them so that we could see what's playing out and what is playing out right now. So in Christianity, it is the breakdown of the patriarchy. It is the breakdown of the patriarchy and the inability of the patriarchy to adjust to what evolution is demanding. This moment that we're living, see it very clearly. Come up here to the penthouse where you are looking at what is going on. What is this moment about? It's a privilege to be alive now. We are beginning to see the end of the fossil age where everything in this earth, where we are people of the earth, people with the element of dirt on our hands, people of the farm, people of oil, people where what we investigated, what we researched, where our frontier was, was what is on this earth, what is in this soil, the soil of our body, the soil that we're standing on, the soil that feeds us, the soil that clothes us. We were people of the soil. And the gods that cared for us were male from the Abrahamic tradition, which is what all of us are. So from that came half God, half man gods. From the Judaic, we have the promise of a Messiah who will come. From the Christian, we have the Messiah that incarnates. And from Islam, we have the Holy Prophet. Three half God, half man archetypes. All of which now are disintegrating in front of our eyes. And the what always happens when this world, when it's time for a pattern of myth, like the Romans, like the Greeks, when it was time to pass on those stories into Christianity, which is what they did, 
which is what they did. They passed on the story of the goddess and Zeus and into Christianity. Christianity absorbed it and said, when's your high holy day? December, solstice. Okay, we'll put Christmas then. <laughs> Equinox for Easter. They, the virgin birth is a classic Roman story. They took those stories and in order to have Christian converts, when, that, when the apostles went around and they, and they started to say, we have a new God, well, can he do this? Yeah, can he do that? Yeah. And so they transitioned the stories. Okay, they transitioned the stories. And then Christianity took the ball and ran with it. Now, we are at this place where we are on the verge of entering galactic community. Galactic. Where the community is, go where the new frontier is no longer looking down, down, down at our tiny earth, but up, up, up at the universe. Up at outer space and inner space. It is the end of the fossil era and the beginning of the solar era. The beginning of fuel by solar, our planet, the food, the nutrition that we will grow. Nutrition, not food. A higher vocabulary. I'm going to take you up to the upper floor. We will grow nutrition. The same word from nurture and nutrition. We will develop energetic sources which will make us more humane. We must become a global community and none of us will live long enough to see that. Make no mistake. None of us. But we are beginning to see the end of one era with the, with the dissolving of fossil fuel occupations, but the rise of the fundamentalists to fight that last battle, like the Romans did with the Christians, put them in the gladiator ring, like the, like the, like the Celts did with the Christians, like the pagans did. Every last group fights for its territory as evolution comes through. They will say this reality of your inner space and what you can perceive, what you sense, you, you multi-sensory being, you don't exist. What you perceive doesn't exist. Always those building the bridge to the next era will find difficulty. The feminists will battle for survival. Those who are multi-sexual will battle for survival. This is not what the old world, the first, second, and third chakra people, this is not their world. And they are correct. It is not their world. And it is terrifying. And for a lot of us, we are terrified of what is familiar to us that we don't want to we, we don't want to lose. And I will tell you, none of you, myself included, is eager to become a global citizen. I'm terrified by what I am observing in my nation. I have an eye on evolution. This is not a temporary anomaly. The democracy is over. This is the direction. Now, we are moving forward, but it's always difficult and so much depends on the quality of choices that we make and how you 
understand that you are now a hologram and a holistic being. You now understand what it means to say, I, I, I have to really take care. My, I sense things in a way that I did not before. And I have to pay attention to that. Because if I do not, I now pay a price in my bio-spiritual life, in my whole environment. And I will pay a price. It will, it will, that, that hemorrhage will eventually make itself known in a relationship. I will communicate it. I will communicate it. And, it's, and if it gets into my child archetype, I will find someone to blame. We have got to live by the rules of energy first and then our body. Instead of the old rules which say the quality of our life is based on the quality of what's outside. That if I don't see an opportunity coming my way, the world sucks. No. We can't do that anymore. It's inner space. What's going on inside of me and how to work with that inner space. It's not just about, I better have positive thoughts. Positive, no, 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 no. It's not that simple. We'll get to that tomorrow. It's not that simple. It's not always about what you want, but about who you're becoming, how you understand, how you, how you grasp this journey that is life, your life. When things, are, how, how it is that you realize, oh, I, I, I always think life should be based on what I want. No. No. You're not that smart. <laughs> You're simply not that smart. You don't see everything. You see nothing. And if I gave you a homework assignment, which is, I want you to identify your problems, really crises, problems, irritations, and what you did that caused your involvement in all of those. Because you'll see you've had a hand in all the horrible things that have happened to you. Either because you misjudged something, you were jealous, you were frightened, whatever it is, Petty, petty, petty. Whatever it is, you gossiped. Whatever it is, you own it. And then make a list of all the wonderful things that have happened to you, and you'll notice that you did not do a thing. <laughs> the surprise, really wonderful things. Meeting, meeting a good friend. When someone, I want you just, just to try to test something out. I want you to just close your eyes for a second and think about Focus your attention on someone. Don't look at me, because I'm not talking about me in your life. All right. Focus your attention on someone you know loves you a whole lot. Loves you a whole lot. And you know that this person's life, don't look at me, close your eyes. This person's life is happier because you're in it, and they know that. And you know that. Think of the size of that truth. How big is that? That that person holds in his or her heart this, this feeling that my life is better because you are in it. And they really dwell on that, that at least once or twice a day, your, your name floats through their heart. And they pause on it. And it brings them joy that their life has you in their heart. And they are grateful. Someone holds you in gratitude that you don't even know about. What did you do to deserve that? How about nothing? And further, 
You can't, there's nothing you can do, nothing to make someone love you that much. Nothing. You cannot take out an ad and say, please, someone come along and love me. There's nothing, 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 nothing. This is what Teresa of Avila says. God in the small details of your life. These arrangements are made. These arrangements are made. What you do is say, I'm putting love in your hands. I can't worry about this. And if you look at all your good friends, did you take ads out for them and go fish for a friend? <laughs> I've never done that. Have you, have you said, I just, I, 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 you know, I've never done that. All the people I love the most, my closest, and that's a lot of people. I've never said, you know, like I need, I need, you know, a friend, I need this, I need, I've never done that. They show up. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. They show up when the time's right and it works and then you just, well, I got a new friend. And it's wonderful. I, you need to, this is the truth. Down here, you think it's all, you're on your own because you don't get it. And you're playing by the wrong rules, which is why you lose the game. You play like a loser because you don't get the game. And what, what we're learning in these decades now is that everything is connected. Everything. My thoughts, my wholeness, if I see all things connected and I realize, look at this, just as I needed this or I need that or this or that, that everything in every moment is connected in that moment to everything. So even as I, you know, if I, I'm, all the things that are positive and all the things that are challenging, those are connected. There's no such thing as a day where all the events of my life are not speaking to each other. And that's a nice way to put it. They're all speaking to each other. And all the people I meet that day are part of everything that's speaking to each other. Now, I had a huge, great big huge, great big huge, one of those insights that took my breath away. And it was after a garlic pizza, so it was a good thing. But, <laughs> but um, you know, when I talk about religion, and it is important to introduce this piece because we are living at this time where everybody has an issue with religion in some way or another, which is fascinating because there's never been a time when everybody's had an issue with religion, but now in this nuclear age. And that's because it's time to have this break off with the mythic stories that somehow our souls have gotten the message to detach. And that the mythic stories of these religions are no longer able to sustain the intellectual journey the psychic journey of who we are and what we, how we need to live going forward. Not just as community, but this is what I realized as a medical intuitive. And that's bio-spiritually in terms of our health. Now, over here. <coughs> Um, into the health field. One, <coughs> one of the first mystical laws is that what is in one is in the whole. What is in one is in the whole. This is a mis and this is, Jesus taught this, 
What you do to one, you do to everybody. What you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. You do to everybody. He wasn't talking about behave yourself. He was teaching a law, <coughs> a mystical law. Buddha taught this mystical law. Every great teacher taught. We are all in this together. Get that through your head. But more than that, get it through your heart and then get it into your soul so that you actually live this in how you see everybody, how you treat everybody, how you make your decisions, that not one thing we do is not known to the whole. Not one thing. Not one thing. So, um, simultaneously, we are learning in our biology in our health, that all things work together, that what we do to one part of our body, we do to everything in our body. Like I said, it with, with the kidney and the heart. But one of the premises of all these religions is that in order to be a member and belief, you must see everybody as different and as aggressive. You must separate yourself from others. That they are enemies. They are different. They are false. So that when Christians look at Jews, Jews look at Christians, we, Islam looks at Jewish and however it is that to be different, when fundamentalists look at Catholics, what, when that in fact, Separation is safety. And that position comes out of fear, and that fear makes people angry. And that idea that people have to be separated, that they're, they're the fearful, fear, fear based teachings turn people into a get their aggression and hate. Hate, which is the exact opposite message. The exact opposite message. And I, if it, we can go into health and why people don't heal when you have hatred in your system. You cannot heal. It's not possible. You're feeding yourself hatred. And you are, in fact, fragmenting yourself because it is against all the laws that the gods have taught. And it is against our own wiring because you're feeding hatred into yourself. What is in one is in the whole. And you're doing it because you're under the illusion that, in fact, they're different than you. That they don't love their children that they don't eat, that they're not hungry, that they're not cold in the winter, that they're not looking for a home for safety. Now, that type of thinking is what we have to evolve out of for the sake of illness. When we look at illnesses that can't be healed, epidemics, these are the thoughts, the vibrations, that prevent the healing of epidemics. Let me give you an example that you can relate to. I have to do this, my ears are popping with a flight. Um, in 1929, the stock market crashed. And I'm giving you a symbolic interpretation of an event all of you know about. The stock market crashed. And the language changed. You could look at the newspapers. We began to talk about how, not just the stock market, but also the um, Dust Bowl, the Great Dust Bowl, which is a, an event in American history that's rarely 
talked about, but it should be, because it was so devastating. And these two events happened at the same time. And the way they were described in the newspapers, the wording is, is very and vitally important. And it was that we were crippled economically. Crippled. What was the epidemic that broke out in the 30s? Polio. Polio. Now, first floor, the classic, classic tribal event that draws a tribe together is war. War. And the globe was feeling a distribution of power and crippled. And what happens is, unconsciously, we elect a president just like us, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano, crippled but empowered, the perfect archetype to make the transition. And then the war comes. And all the empowerment slowly begins. The economic empowerment of the tribe, the return to dignity, the return to that sense of power. By the end of the war, America was the first global power, first global, that had amassed a fortune, it was one of the few nations that hadn't been bombed, It was ready to go, it had the, it had the Marshall Plan, it was all in a totally different position of power in the world. It was in charge of everything. It was Zeus with the fire. Prometheus had done his job. It was a very different world. Okay, do you see, do you see what happened? It's, it's ut utterly fascinating how these historic events, then what happened? We were in a way, how did they write about it? We were economically on our feet again. Now think of all the ways they could have said it. They could have said recovery. But in fact, the most common phrasing was we were econ America is economically on its feet again. And Jonas Salk, boom, the vaccination. So our collective soul, our collective spirit, our collective experience is directly connected to epidemics, just like it is to AIDS. And collective beliefs that hold us together, collective fears, have a great deal to do with our collective DNA and the functioning of our immune system. What we are collectively immune to and what we are not. Am I helping you out? Now I'm going to pause here. You got any questions? No, huh? Wow. Yeah. It's also such a question, but as far as what you're Wait a minute. A little louder. I'm going to, wait, Jean has, Carolyn has a. What you were just saying, as far as in the 20s and 30s and 40s, could you relate to the housing market and the crash of 2008? <coughs> Excuse me. Is, was that and, actually on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, as far as what happened in 2008 and where we are now in the opioid crisis, and um, an example of that. Now, <laughs> are you two related? Oh, um, <laughs> could I? You know what? What is a crisis that is happening? As far as like the crisis that we're in now, as far as um, the language, what the media is using as language, and um, from 2008, from the crash then, 
and the opioid crisis now and the, all the things that are taking place just in the past 10 yeah, years. Yeah, you have to, okay. Well. Yeah, the, the question, yeah, the question is, um, could I relate the crash, economic crash of 2008 and the opioid crisis to the events happening today with the media? And, and well, no, and just how nothing, um, you know, nobody, um, none of the bankers, nobody went to, there was no consequence. There was no. Um, was there ever? Well, no, I'm just saying there was no consequence to the, the terrible things that were put upon us at that time and then how, how things are unfolding now. Mm -hmm. right. right. Because we're not a society of consequence and that's our fault. That really is our fault. We do not demand consequence. We let it ride. What is a democracy but a, but, a, but a system of response and consequence? We do not respond. It's our responsibility to demand consequence by, by blasting the senators, blasting the congressmen, and not stopping. Nobody demands a consequence. So, and they know it. They know the American people are drugged, involved, lazy. They could care less, so long as they can go shopping, eat. And I'm, I'm being harsh, but it's the truth. And they, and they don't, and the truth is, America has not felt the true crisis of this at the level that it really is. It hasn't felt it. Nobody's, nobody like the Depression is in, in line. You know, no, but nobody's going hungry like massive, massive. It's going to increase. But the people who are going hungry are people who are, have gone hungry before. You know, we, we live in a world where we tell ourselves <clears throat> that things can't happen and you don't get. We are living in the age of the unthinkable where it's the unthinkable that is most likely to happen, not the thinkable. So uh, that's why, no, you know, when, when someone <clears throat> says, um, it's so outrageous that, you know, look what's happening that I don't expect any woman's issue to be heard not be, to be responded to at all for years because the patriarchy has nothing to gain by it. And just like we'll, we'll have war so long as women f crave the bad boy warrior. That's the woman's part in it. So don't go thinking that it's all you have to understand the archetypal dynamic. So that's the, the whole dynamic of what makes the Me Too and them also. Nothing is one way. And things account, and we are not a wisdom culture. We never teach wisdom in school. We never say, what's the consequence of this? We are a society without consequence. Where have we ever de dealt with consequence? Where? We haven't held presidents responsible. We don't hold anybody responsible, ever. We don't teach, we don't teach moral conscience in school. We don't teach ethics. We've dropped all that. Where do we teach anything? But, I, but do you understand? And if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you want this kind of society, we have to build it again. We have to start petitioning. I want this taught in my school. I want this taught to the kids. These kids that can't do moral reasoning, 
They don't recognize a moral crisis. Why do you think they take drugs? They don't get moral reasoning. They don't know how to recognize in their gut. This whole time, all my life, my whole career, have you any idea how many people I've taught? Hundreds of thousands. I've almost had a 40-year career. Hundreds. And not one person, not one before God, not one person has ever said to me, I'm in here, Carolyn. I've come to your workshop because I have a crisis of conscience. Conscience is the operable word. Conscience. People talk about consciousness, which means nothing. Nothing. What, is it, what are you talking about? It's an empty word like a masticcioli noodle. It means you're recycling your trash. It's your consciousness. Conscience is the word that's attached to good and bad, right or wrong, evil and, 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 and goodness. This is the word where someone has this sense of this is wrong, this is morally wrong. This thing that happened in Saudi, I mean in Istanbul, where the doctor who sawing the man's hands, fingers off, the reporter says to the diplomat, put earbuds on with some music, it goes easier. This is the level of our humanity now. Here, put on some music so you can't hear him scream. That's like a Stephen King novel. It's like a Stephen King novel. And we have our politicians saying, I don't know, did that happen or not? Now, how does this happen? This is our world. Hitler didn't rise by himself, neither did Gandhi. And this is where we realize this world is all about choice, consequences, good, bad, right, wrong, I need to pay, I need to become conscious. Everything I do, do, everything I am and everything I do matters. How many people will say, nothing I can do matters? And they live that creed because they want to. Because they want to. They want to be independent of the operating system of the whole so they can go about their life as if everybody else is responsible for their psychic weight on this planet. Here, you carry my weight because I just want to have a good time and focus on me. Because I don't believe any of that's really happening and they'll tell me I don't believe in evil. I just did a seven CD set on, 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 on the, the courage to confront evil. And most of my career, I, I deal with people who have said, I don't believe in evil. Really? Really, you're rewriting the script of the universe. There are, there's no good or bad, light or dark. There's just sunlight for you, huh? <laughs> you don't get the mechanism of how creation works. It works in the phoenix rises from the ashes and it falls. There's always the test. The light attracts the dark, and the dark attracts the light. And if you really understand it, in the depths of your darkness, the light comes, make, fights the hardest to get through. Fights the hardest. This moment now is like porous tissue for us. It's like this moment in time where we're between worlds and it's like the concrete is melting into energy and all the forms that have held the world together in this solid way, all the pillars of society, the fundamental pillars for all the world. I, I, I've read military history since I was seven. For all, I've never gone through, I mean, I can't, I read history constantly for all the times we have evolved through wars, through events that have shaped our world, shaped you, shaped 
shaped us for all the events and all the people. Plato to Aristotle. You are students of Plato and Aristotle. You, Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle. This is our lineage, right? For all the shaping, no matter what has happened on the earth, the fundamental pillars have held. And that is the belief that family is a pillar of society. Tribe is a pillar of society. That community is a pillar. That, that we need this. So no matter what happens in the world, whether, whether we go to war, whether we are refugees, we take our family, we stay with our community, and we refine it somewhere else and we set it up immediately. That we have our religion, that we cling to our God, that we must have our traditions, we must have, um, what's the Latin, Carol? Habitus maximus, the maximum habits of the heart must be passed on to our children because this is a, this is a, this is a uh, column, a, a pillar. Since entering the nuclear age, these pillars have all been knocked down. They're all gone. We are the first human beings to exist without these pillars. We are floating in psychic space and we know it without ever being able to articulate it because we haven't identified that. But we are floating. We have no God myths that we believe. We have no communities. We don't pray together. We have no moral accountability. We agree with nothing in terms of what's collectively wrong or right. For the first time in the history of humanity, we have no idea what a family looks like. We have no idea what a relationship looks like. We've created endless patterns and none of them endure. None of them for the first time ever. The vow means nothing. A vow means nothing. We, we are the people who have gutted the soul of the collection of humanity. We have detached. We are the ones that have lost our way. We are floating in free fall. We are the ones who have made God a hobby, a hobby that have made holiness a hobby, that think we can pray as a hobby. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Maybe when it's an option. We are the ones who no longer take our shoes off on sacred gowns because we've decided that we can rewrite the history of the universe to suit our little pea brain. Because we've decided maybe there's a God, maybe there's a nut. Maybe there's good, maybe there's not. Maybe I don't believe in evil, therefore it doesn't exist. Oh, really, Missy? <coughs> oh, really? Well, therefore, let the universe bow to you because you know so much about this structure, about this structure that has always been. It is astonishing to me how people are. That they would ever walk out their door without first acknowledging the order of this universe in their life. It is astonishing. And you wonder why so many people are terrified, afraid, can't seem to focus. They don't even know how this universe is created anymore. They don't even know what, 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 what fills the air. So they go to these charlatans who think they could draw up angels on the stage as entertainers. So they've reduced even heaven to a theater of the absurd for money because that's what suits the narcissist because all the pillars of the holy and the sacred are gone. And let me add finally that the word consciousness suits everybody because there's no sacred to it. So we talk about here, we talk about energy. Do you feel that energy? Oh yeah, what a meaningless thing. Nobody heals at the energy level, nobody. 
It's not until you cross over and get it, take your shoes off on sacred ground, and as Yahweh said to Job, gird your loins, I'm about to talk to you. Where were you when I laid the foundations of this earth that you would challenge me? Where were you when I hung the planets, I ordered the stars, I decided where the oceans would end and the land would begin, where were you that you dare question me? You put yourself where you belong. You bow your head on sacred ground so that when you pray, it's not with this thing, maybe I'll believe you, maybe I won't. You start this way as if I am here. I am here. And that's enough. You don't go shopping with your Christmas list. I want, I want, I want, I want. You want nothing. You bow your head. I'm here. I'm here. Done. And you start with that. Hover over me, God. Just Assume God is not stupid. That you were born with a GPS. And the G is for God. Heaven has not lost you. And when you are in anguish, it's because you don't know the rules. Have I made my point? Now, yes. Yes. Well, I, the word that keeps coming to mind for me is the word truth. Huh? Truth, you know, good and evil, whatever it is, mm -hmm. perception. The, the, the earthquake that's happening, <clears throat> because there is no conscience, mm -hmm. is going to push our universe to, to look for truth. Mm -hmm. Mm. So much of our suffering and struggling and all the things that they have experienced is in our DNA. And there is the theory that um, we are the generation to heal them and then pass the good life on to the next seven generations. And this was um, this was the um, the theory of the uh, indigenous. Which, in, which, which group? Uh, I mean. a, a, a consortium. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was left out, you know, when they went to, uh, when the founding fathers went to the indigenous people because it was their land. Um, this was the one thing that was left out in seven generations. Whatever you do, you do it to protect the future for the next seven generations. That's right. It's the truth. Anybody else? Yes. I um. Do, could we the question? Yeah. Hi. Um. I work in the Middle East, and the question is sort of related to what I. I work in the Middle East, and the question is related to what you've been talking about and how we do no harm. So I work with adolescents and youth on social media and trying to encourage personal agency, self-esteem, social cohesion, and social safety in war-torn areas that were either occupied by ISIS or other places like that. And what, what often happens is we work with these dynamic young people who really have a heart to do something different 
and yes, their tribe usually, which is related to their family and their family's sort of political structure and place in society will tell them, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Particularly for the women, it often comes down to life and death issues. Or um, we recently did a story on a young girl who is- oh, Are you a reporter? We work with youth to help them tell stories about other youth. Uh-huh, okay. And did a story on a young girl who's becoming a ballerina. She's like eight. And the fundamentalist responded, threatened her family, told us to take the story down. And so how do you, any recommendations on how to work in this space while people are trying to listen to you? Okay. This is as true in your own life. Now, this is a jewel. Here's one of your jewels that you put in your jewel pouch for the rest of your life. I want you to dwell on a question tonight. And this relates to what you asked. I want you to pray on a question. <laughs> Where did that come from? Did it sound like a piano? <laughs> Didn't it sound like a note from a piano? Does, is there a piano in here? Yes. Oh, OK. Well, in that case. All right, then it doesn't count. All right, now, I want you to truly pray, and I'm not asking you to answer this from your mind because I could care less what you think. I mean no insult by that. I don't want you to care what you think because you will lie to yourself. Your mind will tell you whatever you want, which is why you never get out of your problems. So, you need to learn to respond to what your soul is saying and not your mind. So assume your mind will tell you whatever you want to hear. It will give you the best answer, the most popular answer, the answer where you get the most attention, the most attractive answer. Are we clear? Yes. So when you go into prayer this evening and when you say, God, direct me, do you want to go forward with vision or backward with safety? This is not something you can ask, answer real fast. I'm asking you to go inside this question. I need you to put the question on like a pair of clothing, like a pair of pants. I need you to go into the question and put it in your heart and realize, I don't want to go for I, I, if, if a vision was given to me, I would try and find a way to ask for, for, for facts and details and, and, and financial, and visions never come that way. They require courage, and visions are ideas that are given to you to use your creativity, your courage. You have to form the clay. You have to form the clay. If you go backwards, you're looking at ceramics that are already done and you're saying, but I want this world again. Forgetting that you're in this place of choice and transition because that world no longer fits you. And if you really get that, you understand the chaos of this world with so many people saying, we want this world of ceramics. We want to go back to coal. We want to go back to this world. We want because so many people fail to tool up to really get that we're going across the bridge to a solar world. So they go into nationalism now. They're going into to ways that say, close those borders, close those borders through Europe, through Brexit, through this or that. There's shutdowns to go back to sovereign organs in the body and 
sovereign states, sovereign this. That's the way we'll survive this. No, the map of evolution is in progress now. We are only moving forward. So when you, your life is only moving forward. So when you say this prayer, and when you're engaged in this work that says, I am envisioning and I'm doing this work, you will meet all these obstacles because of the work you're doing. You have to anticipate it. You are doing the work of obstacle. So when you look at, but I'm doing this wonderful work about ballet, no, you are not. You are doing a work about breaking forms, and you're using ballet to do that. You have to understand the work at the archetypal symbolic level, because that's where the work really is. And it's a very brave girl whose story, and she's participating at the age, at nine years old. And now, let me say this differently. She's agreed to be a participant in an archetypal dynamic as a nine-year-old soul. But if you could see from the penthouse, you'd realize I'm breaking barriers. And this is what I've chosen to do. And if you were to describe your life in the way I say it, or in making, doing stories, you would say, no, you're right, I'm breaking barriers. Because doing stories doesn't even appeal to you compared to breaking barriers. Because you're one of the new. Does that help you? Yeah. And how you do it is you have to keep your, you, you, you have to keep an archetypal perspective as a jewel in your pocket. You have to anticipate what you're, instead of anticipating praise, which is an old world value, and anticipating recognition. You have to pay attention to what you're really, what you're really doing, which is, I, this is very threatening. So, this, because that world is going, if you see it, if you're on the eighth floor, don't expect the second floor to see the eighth floor. Expect the fight. Embrace yourself, not with your fists, but with an energy field. Do you understand? Use the tools of the soul. Use the tools of light. You learn what the immune system of light is all about. The immune system, instead of energy, you're going to work with grace, and that's what we'll talk about tomorrow. You make the choice to use your immune system of grace. You realize that you cannot go, you, you know, because of what I'm working with. If I knew early on, not as consciously as I do now, but I knew by gut instinct, when I started with Norm in the early 1980s, my, my medical partner, Norm Shuley, <coughs> we're still together. Um, that at that time, there was a real combative relationship between allopathic and ho um, uh, holistic medicine. And people had this idea that I'm just doing the holistic route, and I'm just doing this. As if they had to choose sides, it was really a, an expression of, it was either the body or the soul, the this or the that. I mean, it was completely farcical, because you, you, if I broke my leg, I'm not going holistic. I'm not oming. I mean, I want, I, I want the damn best doctor to set that, and then, you know, so people didn't understand, really, were, were, were vehemently, because what they were really doing, that they could see clearly, was they were using holistic medicine to deny they had the disease. It was just a denial, which is why so many died, which is why holistic health did not make the progress it did. At any rate, I, I could see that, and, um, Norm, I took the position 
that we were part, that it was a partnership operation, that it was better to put everything on the table and work as a team with all things at all the time as a unit so that medical intuition and, and the immune system and all the data that I could amass as an intuitive, all the data that I could amass of what I, what I just was learning intellectually, what I knew as a theologian, every single thing that I could bring to the table, everything you could bring to the table with the best of the physicians you got from a brain surgeon like Norm to a holistic, it didn't matter, get it all. Instead of being defiant as if your organic approach was gonna save your life by being hostile to chemical medicine, which is just as useful if that's what you need. And if you're full of anger, that's what you need because energy medicine won't help you. Energy medicine cannot treat anger. Simple as that. And this is what so many people just didn't get, but I figured that out. And what I knew is that being aggressive was never going to work. Never. Now, you can't be aggressive when you look at this question tonight. You look and you say, you feel in yourself the truth of how you are in, if you look toward the future with the demands of the past. I need security, I need safety, I need my title, I need this. You're not going anywhere because the vision is a clean, wide open. Here's, here's a vision, now run with it. And it all depends depend on you. So it's, what do you want? What are you capable of choosing? I'm going home. That's what I'm choosing. <laughs> and I hope, I, hope um, I see most of you tomorrow. Who's going to be with me?